God's idea for humanity is to live in his presence. Without the presence of God, our life is very sad and very empty. So God wants his presence to be on the earth, which is also his glory. Okay? So in Genesis chapter 1, when God created the heavens and the earth and everything by words, the only thing he didn't create by words was mankind. He made him out of the dust of the earth and breathed the breath of life on him. Man stood up a living soul and he had power and authority over all creation. But man rebelled against God, missed God by transgression, so, uh, and uh, the Bible says, and when God came in the cool of the day, in other words, the days were cool in the garden. That's why Jesus went to the heat of the desert to conquer and bring back the cool of the day to humanity. Okay. Jesus didn't conquer in the right atmosphere. He conquered in the most worst hostile atmospheres where Adam missed it in the most friendly atmospheres. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, the Bible says, and then in the cool of the day, God came walking in the garden. Amen. And the Bible says, and man was hiding from the presence of God. Okay, so what did Adam and Eve do? They hid themselves from the presence of God. In other words, in the garden, God's presence was there continually and God walked. And this is what Adam said. We heard your voice. We didn't see you. We heard your voice because God is a spirit. And you will hear a voice behind you. But later on on that. So we heard your voice in the garden. And we were scared. And we were hiding. And God says, why? Why are you hiding? They say, it's because we're naked. God says, who told you you are naked? Okay. So man was hiding from the presence of God. So God tried his best through the ages to bring his presence back to humanity. So the Bible says death reigned from Adam until Moses. So Moses came and gave them the law. All right. The law was like a set of rules that if people kept it, the only thing that God wanted to do through the law is to prove to them their rebellion and he wanted to do something that was to bring his presence back. So when God spoke to Moses on the mountain and Moses said, oh Lord, show me your glory. And uh, God said, I will hide you here in the rock. This be a cleft and I will pass by him with all my glory. You will see me from behind. And then Moses said, God, you now well said, let us go up from here to the promised land. But you did not say who will go with us. And God said, do you want my presence to go with you? And he said, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, let us not go up from here. So what was Moses' cry? We need the presence of God back. God said, right, this is the only way my presence can go with you is by you building that tabernacle. And when they bring the right sacrifices and the right offerings, my presence will manifest. So to have my presence manifested, you've got to build me an ark. So we know we can't rebuild the ark. We mustn't talk about the ark. We mustn't refer to the ark. All right. So uh, Moses, build me an ark. And then God said, over the ark, there will be a mercy seat. Overlooking the mercy seat will be two cherubims looking down on the mercy seat. They will be of solid beaten gold. This ark must be covered by gold. And on the inside of the ark, there must be the golden pot that was full of manna. In other words, we remember when they were hungry in the desert and they went to Moses and they wanted to kill him. And Moses said, oh God, please, these people are going to strangle me and kill me. And then God rained down bread from heaven. They didn't know what it was, so they called it manna. So that pot, golden pot with manna, was there all the time. Now we know if they picked up manna for two days, it were rotten. But this manna with this pot never got rotten. In other words, it was a miracle to prove the miracle of bread coming down from heaven. In that ark was the rod of Aaron. Make it a star of there. That budded, remember? 
It was an almond tree. And remember when Aaron had the staff and the people of Israel rebelled against Moses and Moses said, let every tribe, the head of every tribe, bring their staffs. Now Aaron was head of the tribe of Levi and they put the staffs in the holy place, remember? And Moses said, the staff that'll bud, that'll be the tribe that you know God has appointed to do their duties. So Aaron's staff budded. So, I mean, it's a dead stick and all of a sudden flowers grew. So they put it in the ark and it was full of flowers wherever this ark went. So miracle of the pot of manna, miracle of the staff of Aaron, plus they had on the inside the law of Moses, which he gave. Now remember, Stephen is stoned because he talks about what happened through the desert. And uh, in the book of Acts, the this, this story is rehearsed. How Moses went on this mountain and he received living oracles from God. And the Bible says because of their rebellion and rejecting him, he did not give them the living word. So when Moses went up the mountain, the first time he went up the mountain, he got living oracles from God, words to live by, says it in, and Moses refers to it again later on in Deuteronomy 30, but this time in Exodus chapter 18 and 19, he says he went on the mountain and he said, Lord, I will go and give you them this word that you have given me where they can live by. They refused it, so he went up and he got the law the second time. He came down, they had a golden calf, and Aaron made it. Some translation says he made a golden ox. Why? Because that was one of the gods that they worshipped in Egypt. So Moses came down, and remember, Joshua said the people are singing. And Moses said, this is not the sound of victory. This is not the sound of victory. This is the sound of idol worship. Remember, and Moses came and they, they chopped that thing down and they had to drink the water with the golden stuff in it. Then Moses went up the mountain a third time and this time he had to himself chisel out the law. So Moses gave them the law. And you can read through the New Testament. They said, Moses gave us the law. Moses did this. The law of Moses. So the law is not called the law of God. It's called the law of Moses because Moses gave them the law. Is that right? So there were two miracles just for explanation's sake. In the ark were two miracles. The pot of manna, which was solid gold. The rod of Aaron that budded and above the ark were the solid gold beaten angelic figures and this was in the most holy place where the presence of God manifested so Acts chapter 7 we read on the story is referred to how Stephen was stoned and Stephen says Moses built a tabernacle for the presence of God and he made an ark for the presence of God. Then something is said that I don't know if anybody ever preached on it. He says, and this tabernacle with this ark was only until David. Okay, that is there from verse 45, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, in Acts chapter 7. He says, until David who longed to build a house for God. But he found favor in the sight of God. So Solomon built him a house. But God does not dwell in temples made with hands. This ark tabernacle thing with a pot of manna, the rod that budded, the angelic creatures above that were made out of solid gold was only until David, who longed to build a house for God. But Solomon built him a house, but God does not dwell. In Solomon's temple. Okay. You are ready. So, uh, I perceive that you are a prophet. Where do we worship? We Samaritans believe we got to go to the mountain where Moses found the law. You Jews believe we got to go to Jerusalem because that's where they built the temple. So do we go to Jerusalem, to the temple, 
Or do we go to the mountain where Moses got the law? Jesus said, you don't go to the mountain where the law was given. Neither do you go to Jerusalem where there's a temple. Because God is a spirit and is looking for worshipers that will worship him in spirit. So you can't lay emphasis on the law. Neither can you lay emphasis on Jerusalem. So God says, I'm not interested in the law of Moses, neither am I interested in the temple of Solomon. I'm interested in people that loves me and want to worship me. Okay? So why would God say things like, uh, he does not dwell in that temple? Why does God say things like, we will not worship in Jerusalem? Why is it that some people still have an idea that everything revolves around Jerusalem, while some other people has the idea that everything revolves around the Lord Jesus Christ? So are we going to become an ethnic group again? Are we going to come, you know, segregated and separated and uh, exalt a certain group of beliefs or a certain city somewhere or are we just going to be people that believe God is all over so Solomon built him a temple it also had the portions it also had the outer court it also had the inner court and it also had the holy of holies or the most holy place So if the Bible says in Acts chapter 7, the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle of Moses, was only until the days of David. How is it that people believe that Solomon's temple had everything that Moses' tabernacle had? The Bible says when Solomon built his temple, he got the priests to go and get the Ark in the city of David which is Zion. The Bible says, but Solomon built his temple in Jerusalem. But it's the same place. So why would he say, go get the ark in the city of David, which is Zion? You can read it in 2 Chronicles chapter 4 and 5, and you can read it in 1 Kings chapter 3 right to chapter 8. Okay, Go get the ark in the city of David, which is called Zion. It says, and Solomon built his temple in Jerusalem. Then it says the following, everything that Solomon dedicated was what his father did committed his father dedicated his father gave his father offered so Solomon gave nothing for the building of the temple he took everything that his father gave David and everything that Solomon had he used for his own house he built himself a palace out of all the gold that he gathered and he sent the priest to get the ark and when he built his temple the one wall he put Angels about 20 foot big. Big angels. And he covered it with gold. Because when they brought back the ark, it had no more angels over the mercy seat. There was nothing in it of miracles. There were no pot of manna. There were no staff of Aaron that budded. He says the only thing that was left in the hollow shell was just the law that Moses gave them. Okay, for the people that want to check it out, it's in 2 Chronicles chapter 4. It says when they got back the ark, it was nothing but just the law. So the miracle of manna was gone. The miracle of the rod that budded was gone. The angelic figures were gone. So Solomon built an second grade angel that was only covered with gold but God said it must be solid gold they had no manifestation of the miracles inside the ark except the law that Moses gave them and chiseled out okay I'll go a little bit further when they rebuilt the temple after the Babylonian captivity there was no ark anymore in the Holy of Holies. In Solomon's day, an ark without angels. Sorry if I disappointed your doctrine. In Solomon's temple, 
an ark without angels, without the pot of manna, without the rod of Aaron. In the temple that Herod rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity, there was no ark, Jeremiah chapter 3. And God gave a prophetic word about it. He said, if you don't have the ark again, don't rebuild it again because they couldn't rebuild it. I myself will be present amongst you. So God's desire is, I want to be present. So I'm not, the ark was there for the law thing. So you can't go to Sinai, you can't go to Jerusalem. So when Jesus was crucified and the temple's veil was rent from top to bottom, it was to show the Jewish people that they did not worship God. There was no ark inside the Holy of Holies. In the days of Solomon, there was no manifestation of the miracle in the ark except the law of Moses. Hmm? So uh, God slowly broke down the idea of worshiping in a temple, worshiping in a city. God was during the year slowly and gradually breaking it down to come to a point where he said, woman, God is a spirit. And he's looking for people that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Just something about the Jerusalem factor. Listen to this. Ezekiel says, five times in one chapter, even if Noah and Job and Daniel was in Jerusalem, God will still not spare it after the fulfillment of the prophecies of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah prophesied how they would be in 70 years of Babylonian captivity, how they will come out and rebuild the temple, go back to that city, but then Messiah will come, Daniel prophesied. And when Messiah come, he will break the covenant that they had with Israel in the middle of a three and a half year, or end of a three and a half year period. So Jesus came and said, it is finished, and he fulfilled the law, broke the covenant, no more ark, no more holy of holies on this earth, And he says, refers to Noah, Job, and Daniel, the three people that God calls righteous in the Bible. He says, Noah are righteous, I can't destroy him with the world. Have you seen my servant Job? None righteous as he. And he called Daniel righteous. He said, even if those three live together in Jerusalem at the time of the crucifixion, I will still not save Jerusalem. I will deliver them, but I will make sure that Jerusalem is destroyed because I don't want it as my place of worship. I don't want the temple as my place of worship. I don't want the ark to signify my presence. Jeremiah 3 verse 15 and 16. I myself want to be present in your midst. Is that a shocker? So there goes Jerusalem. There goes the temple. There goes the ark. The three points that people will major on, on so-called end times that will be restored. God just proved to us out of the word that he broke it down, that people will not have an emphasis on that, but will emphasize the Lord Jesus Christ. The crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Galatians. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Now that present evil world is not the rapture. That present evil world was the time then that was run with the temple and Jewish rules and the law of Moses. He said, Get your, Jesus died to save us from this evil, wicked generation. Verse 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. What would be the other gospel? He says, there is no other 
But there will be some people that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than which you have received, let him be accursed. Do I now persuade men or do I persuade God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. I hope there's people listening to me that will say, I, I desperately want to please God. Pleasing unto God or pleasing unto men. Paul says, if this is a true gospel, this one is another gospel. So if this one is cursed, then that one must be blessed. Okay. So what would be the one gospel and what would be the other gospel? So Paul says to the Galatian church, I, I can't believe that you are so quickly removed to another gospel. Okay? He says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which, I, which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man... Neither was I taught it by a man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jewish religion. How that beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And I profited in the Jews' religion above many of my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. So Paul says, I was zealous in what pleased men out of the Jews, learned in the law of Moses. He says, this is where I was zealous in. Just keep it there maybe and go to Acts chapter 22. Paul is now telling his story after he was captured. Verse 26 says, Then Paul took men and the next day purifying himself entered the temple. Verse 28. The people cried out, Men of Israel, this is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and against the law. And against this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple, and hath polluted his holy place. Acts chapter 21, verse 30. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in uproar. Jerusalem, the temple, the Jews were in uproar and they wanted to kill Paul. Verse 36, for the multitude of the people followed, crying, away with him. Chapter 21, verse 40, then Paul spoke in Hebrew to get the Jews' attention. And he said in verse 3 of chapter 22, I verily am a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, the city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers. And was zealous toward God as you all are this day. Okay. They wanted to kill him. What does Paul say? You are zealous to do according to the law of Moses. 
He says, I was exactly like you. I was zealous according to the law of Moses. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And also the high priest doth bear me witness. And all the estate of the elders from whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem to be punished. And then the light shone around him and said, Saul, Saul, verse 7, why do you persecute me? Verse 8, and I said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. Jesus, Paul was persecuting the church. Verse 17, and it came to pass, then I, when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him saying unto me, make haste and get quickly out of Jerusalem for they will not receive your testimony concerning me and I said Lord they know that I am imprisoned and beat and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee and when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed I was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him and he said unto him he said unto me depart out of that Jerusalem Verse 22, and they gave him audience unto this word and then lift up their voice and said, away with such, such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And they bound him and they beaten him and they scourged him. Verse 24, all right? Verse 23, and Paul said to the high priest, are you there? The high priest Ananias commanded them, stood by to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite you, you whited wall. For said you to judge me after the law and command you me to smite me contrary to the law. And they that stood by said, revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I did not know that he was the high priest. Back to Galatians. So let's just jump to chapter 2. Verse 4, false brethren was brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Verse 11, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. Back to chapter 1. Verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Let the people be accursed. Verse 11, chapter 2. I withstood Peter in the face. For before certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with a dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if you are a Jew and you live like a Gentile, why do you want now and not like Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Verse 16, do you not know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ? Thank you, Lord. Verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the winner of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I may live unto God. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain, and I do not frustrate the grace of God. Would somebody now just say, man, I can see. Paul says, I will not frustrate. 
God's grace. He said, I broke down the law. I broke down the Jews' teachings. He says, how can I build this again, which I already broke down? He says, but even Peter tried to take the people back to the Jewish stuff. He says, sorry, how could you be misled to believe another gospel when you already heard the true gospel? Why do you want to go? The context is, why do you want to go back to this thing of the Jews and the law and Moses? Why do you want to be zealous in this thing? I can see what you do because I was like that, but I met Jesus and now I will not frustrate God's grace. It's by grace through faith that we are saved and not by keeping the law. Chapter 3. Oh, you foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Okay? He says, Christ was crucified right in front of you. This is how I portrayed him. Now I want to know, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Verse 5. He therefore that ministered to you the Spirit and worked miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith. Do anybody see that the other gospel is the law one taking us back to the Jew and to Jerusalem? Paul says this thing is gone. Jesus says you're not going to worship in Zion, on Sinai where the law was given. Neither you're going to worship in Jerusalem where the temple was. He says, no, God is a spirit. Now, I want to know, did you get the spirit because you obeyed the law? Or did you receive the spirit because you believed what Christ did and you received it by faith through grace? Now, let's jump to verse 19. Wherefore then serve the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The mediator here refers to Moses. Moses got it in his hand and gave it to the children of Israel. Okay? So the gospel that is of men is the one of Moses. Verse 28. He says, There is now no more Jew, no more Greek, no more bond, no more free. There is no male, no female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, Then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In Romans chapter 4, he talks about the faith of Abraham. And he says, Abraham had a promise that he would be heir of the world. Hebrews chapter 1 says, uh, God spoke in the past by the prophets, but in these laws speaks to us by the son who he has appointed heir of all things. (laughs) Chapter 4. Now I say that the heir... As long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he is Lord of all. But he is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world, which is the law. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we may receive the adoption of sons." Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, you are no more a servant but a son, if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How about then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? Here it comes. You... Again, observe days, months, times, and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. The law with the temple and with the Jerusalem thing. At certain days, certain months, We call it feasts. He says, I try to bring you a gospel of liberty, which is freedom. 
He says, why do you want to be in bondage? Why do you want to again have days, months, feasts that the law endures, that you got to go to a temple in the city of Jerusalem to carry your ark and go back to the sea? I'm not ugly against some group or some people. I just want to help some people. Did you know that when Solomon built his temple, the Bible says he built a big sea in the, in the temple area. And he put 12 golden oxen underneath the sea. A water sea. Okay. He built it, and instead of having what God ordained to be in the temple, he had 12 oxen of gold to prove that he was an idol worshiper. Okay? It's there in your Bible in 2 Chronicles chapter 4 and in 1 Kings chapter 3 to 8. Okay? Verse 16, am I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth? These people zealously affect you, but it's not good. Verse 20, I desire to be present with you so that I can change my voice. For I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, you that desire to be under the law. Do you not hear what the law says? He says, Abram had two sons. The one was bond and the other one was free. The one who was of the bond woman was born of the flesh and the one of the free woman by promise. This is an allegory for these are two covenants. The one was from Mount Sinai, which gender bondage, which is Agar. But this Agar is Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia. And answers to Jerusalem, which now is. And she is in bondage with her children. Awesome. Amplified says this is the same category with the present Jerusalem. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Women, you will not worship on the mountain. You will not worship in Jerusalem. He says this two were two women. This Sinai is now the present Jerusalem. Both this, to me, is bondage. That's why you can't go there to worship. You can't go there to worship. You must understand by faith, through grace, we worship God who is the Spirit. And he who does wonders among you, does he do it by the Spirit or by keeping the law? So I will not frustrate the grace. I will not be a partaker in doing stuff in Jerusalem, rebuilding a temple. I will not be partaking in bringing the law back into the church. I will go for the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Do I now want to please God? Or do I want to please men? If I please men, I'm not God's servant. Because the pleasing of men is another gospel and it's a curse. So I had to withstand Peter because he wanted to take you back to the Jewish Jerusalem thing. But I want to be blessed and I want to stay blessed. We're going to read on. He says, for it is written, verse 27, rejoice O barren that bear not, break forth and cry, you that travail not, for the desolate has more children than she which has a husband. Keep it there and go to Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren, Isaiah, you that bear not, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you that did not travail. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of your habitations. Spare not, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. For you shall break forth on the right, you shall break forth on the left. Your seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not. If anything genders fear in your life, it's not the true gospel. For you shall not be ashamed. I lay in Zion a stone, those that build him shall not be ashamed. 
You shall not be ashamed, neither be confounded, for you shall not be put to shame. Verse 5, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord hath called you as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth. When you was refused, saith the Lord. For a small moment have I forsaken you, but with great mercies will I gather you. In a little wrath hath I hid my face from you in a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on you. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with you nor rebuke you. Verse 11. O oh, you afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I lay your stones with fair colors and lay your foundations with sapphires. Okay? All your children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the place of your children. In righteousness shall you be established, you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather against you shall fall for thy sake. I have created the smith that blow the coals and the fire and that bring forth an instrument for his work. I have created the wasted to destroy. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me. Okay, Paul says in Romans chapter 4 as well as in Galatians, If righteousness is of the law, Christ died in vain. But Christ died so that we can now be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he says, it is written, O barren, break forth. Because your righteousness is of me. It's not of the law. And he says, because your righteousness is of me, you shall be far from oppression. You shall not fear. You shall be far from terror. It shall not come near you, verse 14. All this is for my sake. So... If we believe we are the church, they shall nothing go wrong with us. Galatians. Verse 27, it is written, Rejoice, you barren that bear not, break forth and cry, you that travail not, for the desolate hath more. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But then he that was born of the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so it is now. Nevertheless, what says the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Okay, so I want to help you write. The church were not persecuted by the Roman Empire. The church were persecuted by the Jews. Paul says, I was zealous to persecute the church. Now you are zealous to persecute me. Okay? He says, so if we read the book of Acts, right from chapter 1, right through chapter 28, the Jews tried to kill Paul. The Jews killed Stephen. The Jews persecuted the church, not the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire only persecuted the church later on. So the persecution of the Christian church was only for a generation till the temple was broken down in 70 AD and God established something that did not operate with a temple and an ark with the law of Moses. But he wanted people to understand, I'm going to break down this thing that you can't go to a specific place. I want you to understand that I'm a spirit and I'm all over the world. My presence was there in the garden, but I had to put my presence in a box because of a rebellious group of people and I slowly broke it down in Solomon's temple I had to have a second great angel the golden one was already stolen I had to take the miracle of the golden pot and the, and the, and the buttered rod out and I just had to leave the gospel that was of man the law given by Moses and then when the second temple was built there was no ark because I wanted to prove my presence is not there anymore so Christ came to bring back the presence of God inside of humanity. So he said, break that temple down and I will build a true temple. Hmm? 
So that's what we're trying to say. So we are not like Agar and Ismail. We are like Isaac. We are of the promise. Abram had to chase this woman with her child away. So right now, we have to chase Jerusalem, the temple, and the law away. We're not supposed to accommodate her. We're not supposed to elevate her. We're supposed to cast her out and say, you crucified Christ. You persecuted the church. We will not have an alliance with you. We will have an alliance with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Let's do Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you are circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that is adapted to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. Okay. So I want to repeat now. He says, if anybody brings any other gospel than that which you want to let him be accursed. He said, I also went through that thing. I was zealous for it. And then I met Jesus. He says, then Peter tried to bring people back, so I had to withstand him. Why are you taken away to this other gospel? So don't frustrate the grace of God. Don't go back to the law thing. Hmm? Now, because the temple is not there, and because synagogues are not in operation as it was years ago, the Jews through the years, you know, they had the law on their foreheads. And then they put the law in a little brass box little thing about the size of a full chalk. And they nail it in front of their doors. Till today, if you are a Jew, in the front of your front door, you have this, this excuse like that. And before you go into your house, you rub it and you walk in just to confess that you're under the law. Yes. Any Jew present, they have it in front of their doors. And when they walk in, they rub it to confess they are under the law. So now here's the teaching. I watched it on so-called Christian TV. They said, Jesus, the word, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. They said it's a wrong translation. It should state the law became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they said the Christians have been misled through the years to think they must go away from the law. But thank God, we are now coming back to the law, which is our foundation of Christianity. Paul says, if you go back to the law, you have just fallen from grace. Now you must keep the whole law if you want to please God. He says, why do you frustrate the grace of God? Why is it that Christ died, now you want to preach another gospel? You did run well. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? Galatians 2 verse 2. Paul says, When I went up by revelation and communicated unto the people in Jerusalem the gospel, that I preach the Gentiles privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any man means I should run and had run in vain. Okay, look at this. Paul said, when I came to Jerusalem, I knew they would kill me. So I came to the apostles in private to tell them how I'm running. 
so that I will not run in vain, so that I will not be killed before I've preached the gospel. So when I went out of the midst of the apostles and tried to preach, they immediately wanted to kill me. He said, now I want to ask you, you know, who tried to kill him? The Jews, okay. You did run well. Hebrews chapter 12 says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us with our eyes fixed on the crucified Christ. Maybe we should do 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, verse 24, Know you not that they which run in a race run all but one receive the prize? So run that you may obtain the prize. Hmm? How do we run? Let's go back to Galatians 5. You did run well. Who hindered you? That you should not obey the truth. What is the truth? Again, he says, if somebody comes and preaches another gospel, which is back to the law, back to the temple, back to Jerusalem, that is another gospel. So I want to say, at this moment of time, the other gospel is preached more than the true gospel. You flip between channels, you go overseas, we've just been in America and Canada, you go in every church, there's a Jewish flag, they exalt the Jew, they pay, they send money to people to get the Jews back to Jerusalem. If we go back to that thing, we are just falling away from grace. If we try to rebuild the ark, rebuild the temple, put the emphasis on that's the presence of God. He says, no, woman, it's not the law. It's not Sinai. It's not Jerusalem, the temple. It is freedom in the spirit. Let's finish. He says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know where this scripture comes from? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul is again talking about the Jews, the religion, and the law. He says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been slain for us. Why do you want to bring other sacrifices? Why do you want to have the law if we have? Don't, it says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He says, get this leaven out of your midst. In other words, get every person that elevates that thing, get him out of your midst. What will happen if we really do what Paul says, cast out the bondwoman? What will happen if we make a standpoint to say we will not go for the law of Moses, we will not go for a rebuilding of the temple, we will not go for a present Jerusalem, we will not go for an exaltation of Jew, but we will say God has come for all people of all nations, of all colors, of all times, anybody that believes can be saved. Verse 11, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Maybe we should do First Thessalonians 2. I'm closing. Verse 14, for you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen as they have of the Jews. Because they killed the Lord Jesus, they killed their own prophets, and they have persecuted us. They please not God, and they are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so that they can fill up their sin always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes. Thrice was I beaten with rods by the Jews. I was stoned by the Jews. I suffered shipwreck from the Jews. And I was cast in the deep by the Jews. Who persecuted the church? Not the Roman Empire. They did later. Okay? So what is Paul saying? He says, they have another gospel. Why do you want to bring that back? Cast them out. If you want to accommodate them, take them to the cross and get them saved. Don't put their law above your door. Don't go and rebuild their temple. Because that temple from the beginning wasn't the real temple. 
It never had the real ark. It never had the miracle of the pot with manna and the buttered rod. It never had the angels above it. Father, we thank you for grace. We thank you for truth. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that we will not be in bondage by any person. We thank you that the glory of the law was a fading glory. But the glory that which remain is by grace, by mercy, and by your loving kindness. Tonight we want to make a standpoint and we want to stand for the crucified Christ. We want to receive the blood that washes away all our sin. We want to receive the resurrected Christ that's interceding as our high priest. We will not have another mediator. We will not have another gospel. We will not go to Jerusalem. We don't have to go to a holy land because we are the holy city. We are set on a hill. We are the light of the world and we are the people of God. Forgive people for trying to put people back in bondage. In the name of the Lord Jesus, forgive people that try to rebuild a temple, try to rebuild an ark, and try to rebuild Moses.